I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. We'd like to thank our library partners, more than 1,800 strong across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations for sharing this important content with all of you. But most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. PBS Books, in collaboration with PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs, is pleased to host a conversation with Emmy award-winning journalist, Dr. Seema Yasmin, about her latest book, What the Fact, in connection with Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein's new documentary film, The U.S. and the Holocaust. This film examines America's response to one of the greatest humanitarian crises of the 20th century. It addresses themes of misinformation and contemporary societal historical myths. Let's take a moment to watch a clip. We tell ourselves stories as a nation. One of the stories we tell ourselves is that we're a land of immigrants. But in moments of crisis, it becomes very hard for us to live up to those stories. The Holocaust was beyond belief. People just disappeared. The primary goal was to get to the United States. But the golden door was not wide open. We are challenged as Americans to think about what we would have done, what we could have done, what we should have done. In our better moments, we are very good people. But that's not all there is to this story. A powerful and revealing documentary that premiered in September, and you can now stream at pbs.org. Today's conversation promotes National Media Literacy Week, which highlights the power of media literacy education and its essential role in education across the country. There seems to be no better person to chat about this than Emmy award-winning journalist Seema Yasmin, author of What the Fact, which traces the spread of misinformation and disinformation through our fast-moving media landscape and teaches readers of all ages targeted at young adults about the skills that will help them identify and counter poorly sourced clickbait and misleading headlines. So now let's meet our guest. Dr. Seema Yasmin is an Emmy award-winning journalist who was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, a medical doctor, professor, and poet. She attended medical school at Cambridge University, worked as a disease detective for the US federal government's Epidemic Intelligence Service. She currently teaches storytelling at Stanford University School of Medicine and is a regular contributor to CNN, Self and Scientific America, among others. Let's welcome Dr. Yasmin. Hi, thank you for having me. So great to have you here today to moderate the conversation. It's my pleasure to introduce Isaac Hart. Isaac Hart is from PBS. He's worked with PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs. He is in 10th grade and he is a teen fact checker for MediaWise. He's also a regular contributor to the Teen Fact Checkers Network, The Legit. Is this legit? I'm sorry. Um, which is a series on YouTube. And I'm just going to turn it over to you. I can't wait to hear the questions you ask and your conversation with Dr. Yasmin. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Yasmin, for uh, joining me. I really enjoyed uh, reading the book. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so to start off, uh, for those who haven't read the book, could you offer a brief synopsis? 
I sure can, Isaac. So What the Fact is a very hands-on navigation guide for how to navigate yourself through the murky worlds of misinformation and disinformation. Because all the time, I think we just hear this very negative story that there's so much fake news out there, but we're not really given the good news, which is that there are evidence-based ways for spotting the lies a mile away and for even immunizing your brain against falling for falsehoods. So what the fact is a antidote to that and a solution to all of the false information that bombards us daily. And uh, you open the book with a promise to the reader that you won't tell them how to think or what to think. Why did you uh, see that promise as important? Yeah, I start off the book by saying, hey, free thinker, this book is not going to tell you what to think. And the main reason for that, Isaac, was, well, first, it just sucks when you're talking to someone who's trying to convince you that you're wrong or trying to convince you that you need to think in this particular way. And I think that's a boring read. And this book is very much not boring and it very much respects the intellect of the reader. But also because many of us picking up a book like this, we already think, hey, look, I'm smart. I can already tell what is a lie out there, what's misinformation, what's a disinformation. So I'm playing around with this idea that we all like to think that we are free thinkers, but actually all of us are very susceptible, very vulnerable to falling for lies. It's not our fault. It's the way that our brains are wired to be susceptible to stories. But it's also because some of the bad people out there who are spreading disinformation, they engineer it very carefully to trigger us and to trick us. So that's why I start the book and end the book with this note to the free thinker who's reading it. And a lot of the book also focuses on a disease metaphor um, that misinformation spreads the same way a pandemic uh, would. So, you know, as, as a medical doctor, um, how did you see that metaphor is especially important? Yes, yeah, so I'll tell you a story about this. I went to medical school in England, came to America to be a disease detective in the Epidemic Intelligence Service working for the US government. So my job as a disease detective was to go wherever an outbreak was spreading and try and stop the disease. And to do so, we sometimes use these mathematical models. And what you do with these models is they're basically calculations, they're equations, you plug assumptions into them. You'll say, for example, this is the area that this disease is spreading in. Here's how many people live here. Here's how many hospitals there are, things like that. And then what that mathematical model can help you do is predict in one week, in one month, in one year, how bad might this outbreak get? Where might the disease spread to? So I knew all about those mathematical models. But when I then later went to journalism school and started doing research on the spread of information, my mind was blown, Isaac, because what I discovered was that same mathematical model that I used to track the spread of disease, that exact same model was being used by communication researchers to track not the spread of a disease, but to track the spread of a tweet or a Facebook post or a rumor in a particular community. And so very early on, I saw that when a disease is spreading in an area, it's not just the disease that's spreading. At the same time, there's this contagion of information, these rumors, these myths that are also spreading at the same time. And, and you outline in your book many of the areas where misinformation is present, from the press to social media. And did you ever feel like the, the reader would begin to feel almost like they couldn't trust um, a lot of things that surrounded them? I thought a lot about that and I wrote what the fact to be very optimistic because I truly am optimistic. And I wrote this book because I think a lot of people just get fed that story that there's so much fake news out there. Just be cynical. Just be skeptical. Never believe what you read, see or hear. And I'm like, come on, that's not a realistic way to live. And it's not a very pleasant way to move through the world either. And so because there's a lot of that cynicism and skepticism already, I wrote what the fact to say, hey, here is the bad news that all this all these lies are spreading 
But here's the good news. We have evidence-based ways for teaching ourselves and teaching each other how to protect ourselves from lies, how to spot the red flags, but also on a bigger, like a population level, there are these other things that we can do that are proven to stop the spread of lies and to immunize ourselves. So I very much wrote this with that in mind that I don't want people to be cynical and skeptical all the time. To me, Isaac, that's different from being someone who's a thorough fact checker, for example. I actually want people to have an open mind, take in information, but be really, really savvy at separating the fact from the fiction. Um, and, you know, one way that you you say would be good to um, equip yourself against that type of uh, misinformation or disinformation is knowing the terms. One term which I had not heard before was malinformation. Can you, can you explain what that means? Yeah, sure. So there's misinformation, disinformation, and there's malinformation. And just before I get into the definitions of those, Isaac, the reason I said that was because, you know, I am a doctor. And when someone comes to you and they're sick, Sometimes you can't tell instantly what's wrong with them, but you really can't help a person until you've figured out what's wrong with them, until you've given them a diagnosis. And there's so many different types of falsehoods out there that a really good first step is being able to look at something and saying, I know what type of false information this is. For example, is it misinformation? That's false information that's spread to you by someone who doesn't even realize it's false and they're not trying to hurt you. It might be, for example, someone saying, hey, did you know there's this new disease out like back in 2020, it's called COVID. And if you just gargle with salt water, you won't get it. That's not true. But if a friend was telling you that back in 2020, they probably weren't trying to hurt you. And they probably didn't even realize themselves that they had been misled. That's different to disinformation, which is false information that spread knowingly. Someone knows it's false. And even worse than that, they're spreading disinformation with this deliberate intention to cause harm, to cause chaos. We've seen lots of that in the context of COVID and with other examples like elections and things too. Malinformation is a bit different because it's actually accurate information that's shared with a bad intention. It's spread with the intention to cause harm. And it's accurate information that should never have been made public. For example, someone's personal or private information. So there's many different categories and we get into all of the language and the different subcategories in the book. You've written a lot of books. Um, one of them, uh, Viral BS, uh, focused on medical misinformation. How did you shift to writing about uh, false information on a more broad scale? Yeah, so what had happened is I told you about that shift I had from going from a doctor to a disease detective to then a journalist. And I had gone from tracking the spread of disease to, to tracking the spread of disinformation about disease. Because my whole thing was, it's not good enough to deal with an outbreak of infection if you're not also dealing with the outbreak of information contagion that might be anti-vaccine, anti-mask, anti-science, for example. And I just saw so many parallels that it didn't matter if you were talking about health, or you were talking about politics, the very same tactics were being used to spread misinformation and spread disinformation. And so a few years before the pandemics, I've been studying this for about 10 years or so, I had said to people working to keep elections safe and working to stop the spread of lies about politics, I said to them, it's great what you're doing in the world of politics. Can I get you to come over here and work with me in the health space, in the anti-vaccine space? Like, what can we do to stop the spread of that dangerous disinformation? So I'd already before COVID kind of seen that there was all this overlap and we really need to put our heads together to say, whether it's a COVID lie, whether it's an election lie, the strategies used to spread the lies are nearly always the same. And uh, when reading this book, I could tell it was it was very well researched. Um, can you actually talk a little bit about the research process? Who did, who did you talk to? I talked to so many researchers, Isaac. It was really fun. It was building on my own research because I've been in this space for, like I said, over a decade. But I talked to people who did study things like how lies are spread about elections. I talked to scientists who study our brains, who told me very counterintuitive things. Like for example, the higher your educational achievement, the more biased you can be in your thinking, the more you might dig your heels in and say, no, the thing that I believe already 
must be true because I'm so smart. And so I learned a lot about how our brain is hardwired, how it's susceptible to stories and how easy it is for all of us to fall for lies. But then I learned so much positive news, Isaac, in terms of the cutting edge research that's out there that shows there are tips and tricks and things we can do to immunize our brains against falling for misinformation and disinformation. I actually read a study the other day that uh, said that people who spread political misinformation often know more about politics than the general public, which is interesting. Um, no. You you make a point of uh, not using the term fake news in the book. Um, you know, it's been weaponized and it can be used to mean different things. Uh, was your intention always to steer clear of the term? And, you know, how have you seen it evolve? Fake news is a term that's out there. Often when I use it, I put like quotation marks around it. I'm not saying we should never use it, but I wanted my readers to be informed that, hey, this is a term that gets lobbed like a word grenade, often at the truth tellers, by presidents, by CEOs, by people in power who want to keep the truth away from the public. They'll say fake news as a way of holding down the truth. And then also because we have these really good and accurate terms like misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, my whole thing is let's be precise. But definitely over the course of the last few years, I mean, fake news has just massively increased in how much we use it. Um, and I think often how dangerous it's become, it's evolved to become more and more dangerous in terms of how it's used to suppress the truth. And uh, throughout your book, you have these uh, sidebars where you talk, you sort of dive a little deeper into one specific thing. Uh, one thing I found interesting was sort of a, uh, a playbook to spreading misinformation. Um, and I sort of saw that as tying into like, that if someone understands how misinformation or disinformation is spread, that they are better equipped against it. Can you talk about that a, a little bit? Yeah, this was so fascinating, Isaac, because think about it. Say you're having a, an argument, a heated argument with somebody about climate change or about vaccines. Just digging into the facts and throwing more facts at them makes the argument more heated, makes it, you know, turns it into a fight. What I learned from researchers was there's two ways of approaching this. And you don't have to pick one or the other. You might mix the two. You might pick one for one situation. But you can take that content-based approach like, hey, what you're saying about climate change is false and here's the evidence. But the other thing you can do is take a logic-based approach where you leave climate change, you leave COVID vaccines on the side, and you say, instead of talking about the actual topic and the actual issue that we're fighting about here, let's talk about the strategies that were used to spread this message that reached your ears or your eyeballs. And essentially what often happens is you come down to four or five key strategies, things like the use of fake experts, logical fallacies, the cherry picking of data, the use of conspiracy theories. And you can say, look, these same tactics were used to spread a lie about tobacco back in the day. These same tactics are being used by the Russian government to spread lies about Ukraine. And it takes the heat out of the topic and out of the conversation and shows people the strategies that are used over and over again. And that can be very effective because knowing the strategies can help us see a lies coming towards us a mile away and can actually give us like this umbrella of protection against lies on all different kinds of topics. And in terms of satire, um, you give some interesting examples, which probably are too long to go into, but they are very fascinating. Um, can you talk about, do you see satire as a threat? Um, because it, it can result in misinformation. Yeah, satire is an interesting one, right? Because actually it can be used in a very subversive way under authoritarian regimes to poke at power, to connect audiences, to connect those who are oppressed in those regimes. But satire can also be really misleading and really confusing. There's even a, a thing I mentioned in What the Fact called Poe's Law, which is when you read or hear something and you have to ask yourself, hold on, that sounds wild. Is that real or is that satirical? So the key here is being aware of what satire is, why it exists, how it's used, and being that much more savvy so that when a piece of information hits your ears, your eyeballs, you take that moment and you have the tools to say, okay, this is satirical, or actually this seems really absurd, but I can tell this is factual. In the work I do as a fact checker for media wise, one thing we always look at is, um, you know, does something cause an emotional reaction? Because an emotional reaction is always a sign that you should double check. Yeah. Um, uh, breaking news. Uh, you talk about how sometimes that um, it's overused, I think, in today's media climate. Um, 
I feel like if you watch cable news, you almost always see a breaking news banner. Uh, is that a bad practice? I think it can be a bit misleading and that it makes everything feel very urgent. And just on a very human level, it can make everything feel really, really stressful. I think there's one point in what the fact when I'm like, it just feels like everything is breaking, breaking all the time. It's breaking like it's a bit too much. Can we have a little bit of chill? Um, but that's actually where we can take our time and our attention into our own hands, curate our own news diet so that even if, you know, we live in a 24-7 news cycle, we're constantly getting alerts, notifications, everything is breaking all the time there's all these alarm bells you take control of your time your mental health your peace you decide when you want to turn your notifications off you decide when you want to plug into the information ecosystem don't just be like a passive recipient in that and like you said Isaac a lot of news nowadays is packaged to be emotionally triggering because what all of this comes down to, this entire conversation comes down to the most valuable asset out there that everyone is after. And what is that most valuable asset? It's your attention span. That's what's making billions of dollars for social media platforms and for media organizations. So yes, we want to be informed. We want to strike a balance where we look after our mental health and where we are in charge of our news diets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, is there a takeaway that you'd, you'd want people to um, look at? I think my overall takeaway is that if you keep hearing about fake news, you keep hearing misinformation and disinformation, it all sounds doom and gloom. It sounds like the problem is so big that it's just hopeless. My biggest takeaway to everyone watching right now, everyone who reads What the Fact, is that there's really good news in that there's an antidote to this viral spread of misinformation and disinformation. And the antidote is us. As long as we're well informed, as long as we have the kind of toolkits that exist in this book, actually, we can be the person who breaks the chain of the viral spread of a lie. We can be that savvy person who doesn't spread it because we spot the lie a mile away and that we can take charge of the information ecosystem that surrounds us. We don't have to be deluged in the tsunami of news and social media alerts that are out there. And uh, to continue the conversation, uh, I'd like to bring back in our host, Dr. Uh, I'd like to bring back in our host. <laughs> Thank you, Isaac. Um, so a quick question. I mean, this conversation has been illuminating. And I, I want to remind everyone, actually, that I'm Heather Marie Montillo. You're watching PBS Books. We're here with Dr. Seema Yasmin, who is uh, the author of What the Fact? <clears throat> Finding the Truth in All of the Noise, which is a YA book, but it is it is great for all ages to be able to learn about navigating information, especially misinformation, malinformation, et cetera. So back to the conversation. So Isaac, you are a fact checker, a teen fact checker for media wise. Can you tell us what, it, what that is? What do you do? So yeah, a lot of people are often confused when I tell them that. Um, but what we basically do is we look for online misinformation that's relevant to people my age. Um, I'm 15. Uh, and we try to not just fact check that information, but also uh, teach them how to fact check. Um, so uh, we, I primarily do my uh, fact checks over YouTube, but we're also on uh, other social media platforms as well. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you've guided this conversation thus far. I'm hoping to talk a little bit about Student Reporting Lab and some of the labs and some of the work that they do um, in promoting information and questioning of information. And so if I can just share with you that, in fact, PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs is working to help young people to learn more about information and reporting. PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Lab is also working to help young people to learn about information and reporting. In fact, on Tuesday, November 1st at 8 p.m. on YouTube and on Facebook, PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs will premiere a new special, We the Young People, Moments of Truth, showcasing the voices of young people as the 2022 U.S. midterms get underway. It will also cover an array of topics, including how to combat misinformation. So I just want to underscore that this is certainly an important topic. And Dr. Yasmin, your book 
is exactly what we all need to hear. As a mother of teenagers, I also feel like your book is a godsend because I don't think often in conversations, and for those of you out there watching, maybe you are a young person or maybe you're a parent or related to a young person. I know a lot of my teenagers get their facts from TikTok you know, and YouTube. And so what you're giving them is a guide for success. And Isaac, the work you're doing is helping them to also learn what's true and not true. So I want to thank both of you for all of your efforts. Before I share with you a clip that actually Student Reporting Labs produced, um, and it is about misinformation and, and activism, and let's take a moment because then I'd like your feedback and your thoughts on why it's important. A lot of conflicting information Stop online. Stop spreading misinformation. Stop and fact check something. Stop spreading misinformation. Misinformation is a significant issue when it comes to news and current events spreading around. Aiken Wang, an upcoming junior at Westview High School and president of the Awareness for Change Club, has seen this issue firsthand. Instagram can be great at raising awareness. It's not really so great at actually educating people on policy issues. And if you're on Instagram, maybe you can see like a few dozen political posts a day. Maybe if you really are on Instagram, a few hundred. Most people simply don't have the time to like fact check everything, no matter how smart or how diligent you are. And so if you don't really have a good background on the topic, it's very easy to be misled. Most people have great intentions when they post on social media about current events. Teenagers, however, may not always understand the harmful repercussions of the messages they are promoting. I guess there are like quite a bit of posts that you might not necessarily agree with, but they'll kind of like imply that you're a bad person if you don't post them. At that point, you, you no longer post things because you believe in them, but because everyone else is doing that, and that can certainly be very damaging. Recently, conflict in the Middle East has been an active topic of discussion amongst teenagers on social media, which allows space for fake news to go viral. In the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there's been a lot of misinformation from both sides, and so clearly there have been there's um, special interests on both sides, and they're not really providing an accurate view of the scenario. They're just trying to gain support. From my point of view, everyone's an activist, right? An activist is simply someone who cares deeply about anything. Usually, it tends to be a political and something that they care deeply about and probably where they're willing to do something to invoke change. There are plenty of solutions anyone can implement in their day-to-day -day life. Things as simple as staying informed, being empathetic, and looking for initiatives to take in their own communities. So simply make sure that the sources where you're getting your info are true. I also think protesting um, in person is very important too. And so by protesting, we can reach out to a variety of um, different age groups, different ethnicities. So, so it's a much broader reach and it's a heightened sense of importance because they're seeing us on the streets with signs as opposed to, you know, just like scrolling through your phone. It's a bolder method of making your opinions heard. Joining clubs such as Awareness for Change and urging even the youngest of our generation to stay involved in the politics that surround us are crucial steps to keep moving forward. Tolerance isn't being taught. Will you do anything to change that? There's so many issues in the world, right? And you'd be overwhelmed if you try to like address all of them at once. But I think it's very important that we do what little we can to, you know, make make the world a better place. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? For PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Lab, I'm Thais Jolde in San Diego, California. Well, I feel like this clip is a great segue to continue the conversation with Isaac and Dr. Yasmin. If you could share a little bit about, was there something striking um, for you, doctor? And what were your thoughts? And are there different uh, like through lines that you see align with your work or where maybe they diverge at all? One of the things that struck me was this truth that we often will share something, not because we believe in it, he said, but because everybody else is sharing it. And that's a really critical thing to recognize yourself doing and stop in your tracks if you realize that you are doing that. Also, one thing that social psychologists who have studied us and the way that we share information, one thing they've spotted about us is that we'll sometimes share something because we get kind of these status points or hierarchy points in our communities and our friendship groups if we're the first one to share something new. But that can be a red flag for actually you're sharing false information. You're sharing something so novel, it's not been reported elsewhere. 
because it's not factual. So I think that was something that really stood out to me and reminded me of yet another trigger for false information and another thing to watch out for in our own behaviors. Thank you. And what about you, Isaac? I think the piece does a great job of sort of looking at the issue from an angle um, of a young person. Uh, and it's, you know, it, getting young people concerned about the cause of misinformation, but also not, um, not, uh, not pessimistic about it. As Dr. Uh, Yasmin would say, we need to, uh, to uplift and be optimistic. <laughs> For sure. You know, to reflect on what brought us together besides Dr. Yasmin's book, What the Fact, it is also because of the US and the Holocaust and the film that came out this fall on PBS. And I often think about really how Americans were getting their information what they knew when, and also the myths that have been written into history about maybe Americans not knowing things. Um, and so what I was thinking is we could watch a, a clip and then I'd love your response. And, and what I also wanna remind all the viewers out there of, during the 1930s and 40s, most Americans got their news, word of mouth, right? The radio, newspapers, or it would be the trailers before film. And so with all of that being said, let's take a moment and watch this clip. I speak tonight to those people in the United States of America who feel that the destiny of this country does not call for our involvement in European wars. There was another voice on the radio now, too. The voice of the only American whose fame approached Roosevelt's. The celebrated aviator Charles A. Lindbergh. His message was very different. These wars in Europe are not wars in which our civilization is defending itself against some Asiatic intruder. This is not a question of banding together to defend the white race against foreign invasion. We must not permit our sentiment, our pity, or our personal feelings of sympathy to obscure the issue, to affect our children's lives. We must be as impersonal as a surgeon with his knife. Lindbergh had first visited Germany in 1936. At the invitation of the American military attache in Berlin, who was eager to glean information about the fast-growing Luftwaffe. He returned two more times. The Nazis did everything they could to impress him, awarding him the service cross of the German eagle. And Lindbergh was impressed. He admired the regime's virility and emphasis on order. His wife, Anne, thought Hitler a very great man maligned by what she called Jewish propaganda. The couple had even considered moving to the leafy Berlin suburb of Wannsee until Kristallnacht made them rethink. My admiration for the Germans is constantly being dashed against some such rock as this, Lindbergh wrote privately. I do not understand these riots. It seems contrary to their sense of order and intelligence. They have undoubtedly had a difficult Jewish problem, but why is it necessary to handle it so unreasonably? On his voyage home from Europe in 1938, Lindbergh had been irritated by the number of Jewish refugees among his fellow passengers. Imagine the United States taking these Jews in addition to those we already have, he'd written in his diary. There are too many places like New York already. A few Jews add strength and character to a country, but too many create chaos. And we are getting too many. This present immigration will have its reaction. Our bond with Europe is a bond of race and not of political ideology. It is the European race we must preserve Political progress will follow. Racial strength is vital. Politics a luxury. If the white race is ever seriously threatened, 
it may then be time for us to take our part in its protection. To fight side by side with English, French, and Germans, but not with one against the other for our mutual destruction. If I should die tomorrow, I want you to know this, the president told a friend. I am absolutely convinced that Lindbergh is a Nazi. For the next 27 months, Franklin Roosevelt and Charles Lindbergh would engage in a bitter struggle over whose vision of the country would prevail and about the future of Western civilization itself. So a very powerful clip, and it gives us a lot to think about. I'm hoping for responses from both of my, my guests about thoughts, realizing that in a lot of ways, Lindbergh had the ear of many Americans, helping them to form their ideas um, of what they thought about the war and what they thought about America. Yeah, and one thing that I'll add, and I had to pause when I was first watching this back in September, was the idea that the narratives and the propaganda that began during a war that ended 75 years ago continued and were perpetuated and made their way into some of our history books. And the reason that I paused was, I mean, so much of this was hard to watch, but there was this point that was made in the documentary that I felt incensed that I had not been taught in school. So for example, we learned about Kristallnacht, that awful November 1938 pogrom, but I did not know and only learned for the first time this year because of the Ken Burns documentary that there had been this effort by Hitler ahead of the pogroms asking other nations to take the Jews out of Germany with full kind of this messaging about what might happen to them if they were not allowed to leave safely. And I was so incensed by this and I felt so silly that I didn't know this, that I had fallen prey to this narr this false narrative that protected my country, the UK, and my country, the US, and kind of their image that I tweeted to my followers, did anyone else know this or learn this in school? Are we just learning it now? And the responses were so mixed. And I think that's one of the things that floored me is that those narratives can per persist and be perpetuated for decades, for nearly a century. And that harm continues to be done until we re-educate ourselves, until we relearn and realize that so much of what we were taught was a revisionist history. I think those are really great points. And what about you, Isaac? It almost leaves you speechless. Uh, extremely tragic. And, and I think... Um, Simply put, it, it demonstrates the real world and real life consequences um, of, of information, of, of, of false information. Well, going along with what has already been said, the movie really underscores this myth, right? That the U.S. was said to be the land of immigrants. The film explores how the doors, these golden doors were opened and it's where Jews just hope to get. And when, when ships arrived, sometimes they were turned away. And it's something that once again is left out of history books. It's why Ken Burns has said this is one of his most important films of his career. And, and I, I think of all, of all of that I've learned um, and not an easy watch, but an important watch. Mm -hmm. and, and to think about the myths that we sometimes read and how history is, is recorded and created and how information and access is created. And that is why I'm gonna throw it back to both of you <laughs> who are the experts of information and navigating it and, and knowing all of this and well, seeing it, where we are today, what should we do, where should we go? That's exactly what I was thinking was bringing this historical story and this very essential documentary to today. And I was thinking about those false narratives that were spread 70, 80 years ago and thinking what how, what can we learn from them and the narratives that were pushed and the power that was had by those in positions of authority to dictate and manipulate the facts and how should that frame the way that we look at reporting on the violence in Palestine now, for example, or the, the war in Ukraine? How should we be looking at 
who gets to tell us the news? What is their agenda? Whose side are they on? Whose voices are they including? When I watch a news story about Palestine or about Ukraine, whose agenda is being served and whose stories and voices am I not seeing and hearing? And those are difficult questions to ask, but actually it's one of the good things about social media for all of the negatives that we talk about, that it sort of has leveled the playing field. It sort of has democratized that information ecosystem and, and made many more people publishers, but then we're entering a quagmire and we need to do that armed with all of those tools of, I'm going to ask good questions and I'm going to know and I'm going to be savvy about how to get good answers. Isaac? I think we, we live in an incred incredibly digitized age now, but we can we can really use the examples that this this period um, can teach us, especially with with the skills of, of Ken Burns documentaries um, and uh, use that to guide us forward as a nation of immigrants. I think one parallel we can see is is how the U.S. Um, you know, allows immigration uh, from Afghanistan uh, after the U.S. withdrawal. Well, there is so much to cover, but I feel that the world is a better place with what the fact, because it gives us a tool to be able to navigate this. And it gives parents something they can give to kids. And I think, honestly, this is a fun read for kids. Isaac, do you agree? I completely agree. No, no, no. No disagreement there. <laughs> and it helps. I mean, I'm sure Isaac knew some of it because this is his area, but I think it really helps people to understand and to to prepare themselves to be able to go out there in this information realm. Many young people out there right now, they don't know the world without social media. Social media was always there. So I think understanding what I need to learn and what Dr. Yasmin has already researched for us all, it has been, ha, is really a great addition. Um, it is the close of the program, but I want to ask both of my guests if there's anything they'd like to add as we close the program. Dr. Yasmin? My overarching message is one of optimism and anti-cynicism that actually keep an open mind and reading what the facts will teach you how to do that safely, how to be willing and able to reassess your beliefs, not just dig your heels in and be convinced that everything you think is right is right. And again, I'm just really optimistic that we when we're educated and informed about these things, we are the antidote to the viral spread of misinformation and disinformation. Isaac. This book was was great to read. I learned a lot and um, it, it was it was particularly fun. Uh, the examples are interesting. Um, the writing is dynamic uh, and it, absolute great read. Thank you. Well, there we have it. Need to close the program. I'm Heather Marie Montilla. Thank you for watching PBS Books. Until next time, happy reading.